come with us on a journey into the unknown, the unexplained, and the unbelievable. We will test your senses and challenge your beliefs. A world where science and religion clash. Or do they? You will meet real people and hear real stories, but you will not believe. You will witness strange sights and hear strange sounds, but you will not believe. This is the New England Ghost Project. Welcome to the Nightmare. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ghost Chronicles Morning Edition, right here on the net, New England Talks. Also on uh, 102.9 HD2. I always have to look at the... 102.9 FM HD2. Yeah. I, I always have to look at that because... That's I, why uh, it's there. Yep. Anyway, uh, we have a great guest today, but um, do you know the man prayer? I do not. No? No. No, the man prayer. Remember, I didn't make it through confirmation, so... The man prayer. Oh. Yeah, so it's not Catholic. It's I bet you. I bet you. I guess knows the man prayer. She's from Canada. Yeah, flip her up. Anyways, let me introduce and then I'll ask her. Uh, joining us now is a author, an artist, a witch, and an all-around good-looking chick, Susan Dementor. Deme, de, uh, shoot, Demeter. Demeter. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Susan. Hi. I How's it going? Hope I didn't offend you. Anyway. No, absolutely not. Um. So, do you know the man prayer? The man prayer. You're from Canada. You should know the man prayer. What's it got to do with Canada? I will explain it. Okay. Please do. <laughs> okay. She does not know the man prayer. I'm a man. Okay. This is the prayer. Mm -hmm. I'm a man. I can change if I have to, I guess. <laughs> that's the prayer. Oh, that's kind of like haiku. That's, and that that's, is, that's that is. That is always the closing line from the Red Green Show, which is made in Canada. Really? <laughs> it might be a haiku, Susan. That's another good call. Yeah. I, you know what? I, I've never really watched the Red Green Show. Oh, my God. You are missing perhaps the greatest man <laughs> show ever made. Yeah, Susan, hit YouTube and look it up. Yeah, you're going to love the Red Green yeah, Show. Yeah. yeah. If the women can't find your uh, good looking, <laughs> they better find you handy. All right, and something like that. Yeah, he duct tapes everything. Um, always uses great things like keep your stick on the ice. Oh, yeah, it's great. I mean, can it, strictly Canadian. Oh, wow, I'm surprised. My gosh, <laughs> I haven't even seen Shit's Creek. Oh. <laughs> I haven't either, to be honest. This with show you. is pretty much Shit's Creek. <laughs> Susan is from Canada, living in Italy now. We're doing this from Italy. How's the hockey in Italy, Susan? Because we're all <laughs> hockey players. <laughs> I think that there is some, like there are some ice arenas in the, like the northernest part of Italy where there is, um, like you get a lot of skiing and things in Sutiro, which is part of Austria. But where I am, um, which is more central, closer to central Italy, uh, and then of course southern Italy, no, there's no hockey. Sorry. <laughs> uh, what do they do? I don't know. I don't know. It's <laughs> okay. You know, even even though I'm Canadian, I don't really miss ice and snow. Um, wow. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't either. Yeah, no, it's it's like we do, we do get it where I am. I'm actually in northern Italy, but I'm not. I'm just on the Tuscan border. I'm very actually close to Florence, uh, which is central Italy. So we already have palm trees and things like that. And we do get some snow because I'm at a high elevation. I live in the mountains. Um, but it's very, compared to Canada, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's very mild. You, you were saying before the show that it's an ancient town, huh? It is. I live in a very rural, uh, area and I live in a village. So I went from Toronto, which is, you know, it's Toronto. It's, it's mm. four million people to a village of about, I'd say, you know, 14, 15 people in the winter time. Um, in the summer it gets a little bit, uh, more, people that live here because uh, they come here as a summer home. I'm surrounded by about 1,500 hectares of nature preserves. So we have deer and wolves and boar. And it's like, it's, it's really, really cool. Like for a witch to be able to be in nature, 
Um, and then to, of course, have all this, this ancient history here, like there's the Etruscan runes that we have, ancient Celtic sites, Roman roads. It's very atmospheric and, and it's where I was able to write my book. My, my studio, actually, that I'm talking to you from faces uh, an ancient mountain peak that was sacred to the early Christians and the early pagans. Wait a minute. I don't all I, ancient I'm not all mountain peaks ancient. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, no, the, yeah, but I mean, like the, uh, it is ancient, but uh, the people that uh, the ancient peoples that lived here, they viewed this site as a sacred site. So it's, it's ancient as a sacred site. Um, no, no ley lines going through it or anything. That I'm not too sure of, but I think that a lot of the these sites were. Um, they were created on ley lines uh, by these uh, the ancient people for the energies and what they felt there. Yeah. How, how did a nice Canadian girl end up in a village? In yeah, Canada? that's kind of a yeah. stretch. I I married uh, my husband, an astrophysicist from Poland. <laughs> so, Holy moly. Wait a so second, from she... Poland and you ended up in Italy? No, 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 from Bologna. Oh, oh from Bologna. 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 I'm sorry, not I it was Poland. Poland. <laughs> I miss her. So that's why she uses big words. <laughs> Talks about her husband. Like, mm. Yeah. Imagine that, imagine that conversation. <laughs> no. Well, he's, he's you know, he's a scientist, but he's very interested in our subjects. And he's actually spent a lot of time uh, investigating uh, the strange light anomalies in Hestalen, Norway, um, which were famous because yeah. uh, Alan Hynek went there and investigated them. And they, they are still occurring. Um, so he is actually very open-minded to our subjects, which is, is good. Does he have a theory on what the, those lights are? Because I've heard of all of them. Um, he he really doesn't put a, an absolute interpretation on them because mm -hmm. there's no real proof to what they are. Some people feel they're extraterrestrial. Other people feel that they're like a natural um, earth light or a plasma light or something. But he does feel that there's something more strange to them than just a, a mundane explanation that they're, um, and the people there have had very strange experiences uh, with these lights and seeing like UFOs, like structured spacecrafts and things like that. So there's definitely something that's going on there, so. All right, so when you get a glass of wine in Italy and you go out on the back deck to watch the full moon Is it rise wine? or up there, yeah, um, probably not, <laughs> I'm guessing not. And you go out with your astrophysicist husband and his witch wife. What is that conversation like? <laughs> uh, usually we're talking about strange stuff because, I mean, how can you not? We have this atmospheric place with this really ancient history. Uh, and, you know, and we're both interested in UFOs. And, and so, yeah, we have some really interesting conversation, that's for sure. Have, um, either, of you, have either of you individually or together seen a UFO? Uh, I have seen um, many strange things. And in fact, um, the book that I wrote, Cosmic Witch, is about my initiation experiences as a witch or into magical thinking through these experiences I had as a child, which I initially thought were ghosts. And then um, later on, I came to think of them more as a UFO experience because as an adult, I started having experiences that were definitely UFO oriented. So, but that is the basis. I've, I've had weird experiences all my life. Um, and then I, we, I've gone out with um, my husband on a couple of his uh, expeditions as well here in Italy, looking at strange light phenomena that we have here. So we're, we're pursuing that as well. So you guys are really into this UFO stuff, right? Well, yeah, because there is definitely there is something going on. There's a mystery to be solved, and yep. uh, and even if we never solve it, it's the the journey itself. I think is the most important thing. Uh, that's, yeah. that's the fun part. I mean, it's, it's, it's what keeps us going. But they, um, you know, it, it's not a, a a new theory because it, it's believed that a lot of uh, ghostly activity are related to paranormal in fact a lot of like even bigfoot and shadow people and all that stuff is uh supposedly has a relationship to ufos and depending on how you you know your own personal views of it but you know even dimensional 
uh, ships and stuff, dimensional, dimensional um, crossover and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. it's weird. Oh, so definitely, there, there's, there's a definite crossover or some thread that is between all of these various things. And if you, if you take the time to look at like even Sasquatch. Sasquatch um, is often seen, for instance, I've recently learned this through my friend Joshua Kutchin, um, who wrote a book um, on, uh, on Sasquatch and the paranormal aspects of Sasquatch, like where the footprints end. And one of the things with Sasquatch is he is often seen in Europe with, when he was in Europe as a wild, wild man, uh, historically, <laughs> Uh, uh, with a woman in white and light balls and things like that. And then in North America, you have all sorts of uh, reports of people who claim to have telepathy and things like this with this creature. Um, and even the, the fact that they're making knocks in the woods is similar to the poltergeists. Uh, the alien pilots, the, the pilots of the UFOs, they, they come walking through walls. This is something that ghosts do. All of these types of things are also ac accompanied by the light balls. So it, to me, these similarities, they may not be the same thing, but it tells me the mechanism may be the same as to why we're experiencing them. And sense. yeah. Has your husband ever talked about, because the thing with aliens for me is uh, the physics of, and I'm going to use the word as an amateur, the physics of interstellar travel. In other words, I don't know if aliens, I don't know if people could get here via oh, yeah. interstellar travel. They, they would have to be some sort of dimensional shift. It would have to be some sort of uh, physics that we're not yet aware of or can't take advantage of because it seems like getting in a ship and traveling light years well, doesn't seem practical for most life. The first thing you have to ask her if she believes that UFOs are aliens from other planets. Oh, okay. So do you? Um, I used to, and um, when I was much younger, and I, my first UFO experience was when I was 23. And at that time, if you had asked me, I would say, well, it, it certainly seems so. It wasn't until years later after having these UFO experiences and really doing soul searching that I realized that my my commitment to the ETH or the extraterrestrial hypothesis was based more in my desire for it be, to be true. Because of course I was a kid during the Apollo moon landings. I remember how excited my parents were. I'm still like, I'm, I'm watching all the Elon Musk you know, rocket launches and things. I get so excited. So the idea of there being a Star Trek type universe or a Star Wars universe, and there's many aliens coming to visit us, that for me, I was more a believer when I, I realized, like thinking about it, I was more believing in that because it was a desire of mine for that to be true. And when I realized that that's why I was so unwaverly wanting this ETH, it freed me up to start looking and examining the UFO enigma from other points of view. And I did write a chapter in a book called UFOs Reframing the Debate, which was put out by Robbie Graham in 2015, where I explore UFOs from a parapsychological lens. Um, in other words, forget about what the craft looked like or you know what time of day it was and that, and instead focusing more on the witnesses and how it affected the witnesses and more of the high strange things like telepathy, ESP, psychokinesis. So it was more of a parapsychology type thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and when when you really start looking at these cases, and I mean, I, I talked to many, many people uh, over the years that had UFO experiences. And when you go and sit down and have a cup of coffee with people and you talk to them, and, and uh, I was always open and saying, hey, I, I can understand because I've seen weird stuff. Um, then it would be it would always um, surprise me a little that they would then open up and say, "Yeah, well, you know, I had this weird experience, but I also grew up in a haunted house, or you know, or things of that nature that you know I, I saw a ghost when I was little, or that tells me that there's more of an interconnection there." And unless you meet with people and talk to them and let them get to know you, you, you miss out on those details. And I think that the nuts and bolts ufologists 
really don't want to hear this stuff or they, you know, they don't pursue it and maybe they should because there's a lot of high strangeness and weird stuff that go along with the, the UFOs that, like okay. I said, the I, devil's in the details. It seems like we just talked around it. So if, if UFOs aren't extraterrestrials and they're a paranormal experience, what exactly are they? You know, I, I really, I don't a hundred percent know. Um, I have my own belief systems because of being a witch and being close to nature and earth. I feel that, that this could be something that is occurring here on earth that is trying to communicate with us. I feel that there is some other intelligence involved, but exactly what that is, I don't know. I do know that UFOs, the way we describe them, if you look at the motifs and if you look at the patterns of how people experience UFOs, Jacques Vallée, um, the, the famous ufologist, uh, he, was, he wrote a book called Passport to Magonia in 1969, which demonstrated how the UFOs of today really are similar to the fairy experiences that people were describing centuries ago. Um, even down to the idea that some of these people were describing what they called a fairy wind that would leave like a lump on their skin that was uh, usually when they would cut it open, it would be like a, some detritus, some little pebbles or wood or whatever. Very similar, though, to the idea of, a, of an alien implant that we have today. There's a lot of common things. So it's almost to me like with the UFOs, what we are living in now is a modern folklore and we're literally living it just the way they did centuries ago. Only their interpretation was fairies or, you know, uh, some other mythology. Like the idea to me of, of, of some of these experiences being down to, you know, scientists, space scientists coming from another planet and, you know, examining people in that, I just, it doesn't make logical sense. To yeah, me. that's that's a problem. I worked in the the Apollo program, of course, uh, Lou knows that, but, uh, and I love science fiction, love Star Trek, love Star Wars. I mean, I, to have people from other planets, I mean, I mean, that would be yeah, great for me. But the I fact also that we know, aren't at the top of the evolutionary chain would be a comfort to. Who says we're not at the top of the evolutionary chain? No, I'm saying the idea that we aren't at the top would be comforting to me. That Who says is, we aren't? Yeah. Visit us doesn't mean it. No, well, the Star Trek universe. Stupid. Maybe they can't do cross repulsion. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just want to add, though, that I absolutely believe that something is going on with people and that they're describing exactly what they feel they are perceiving and experiencing. But that doesn't mean necessarily that is what it is. It's like the idea of the UFO being in the sky and we're seeing a spaceship. And I have seen one personally with with other witnesses. So I know these things happen. But in examining my own experiences and doing my own soul searching, I realized I'm not certain it was a spaceship. At the time when I saw it, if I could have picked up a rock and thrown it at what I saw, which was this big diamond shaped looking spacecraft over Lake Ontario, uh, back in 2001 it was, uh, if I had thrown a rock at it, I would have expected to hear a metallic clink. But then in the way it behaved, the way it disappeared, it was like almost like it was as if it was bobbing along over the lake like a kite. And then it slightly turned and then disappeared. To me, this is not how a spacecraft would, would behave. So just because I was seeing something doesn't necessarily mean it was so. And one of the things I have done with UFOs and I'm doing as well with ghosts is, is trying to look at the symbolic content of the experience itself and seeing perhaps what might come out from that. So if someone is seeing a spaceship and it's not necessarily so, what, what could it possibly be or what could it mean if it's personal or on a societal level or, you know. So that's kind of where I'm at with, with all of these things now is trying to, to delve, peel it back. I look even more at the psychology of it then. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm more leaning towards parapsychological lenses or tools at this point to examine UFOs than the, the nuts and bolts stuff. And, and I think that it's good that people are doing that. It's just for me personally. I don't feel it's a satisfactory answer to the UFO problem. 
See, the, the problem I have with a lot of it is, is that there's so much about this planet we live on that we don't even know about. Yeah. And some of this UFO stuff is, uh, I'm not sure if it isn't natural. Uh, you know, we, we, have, we have islands that were charted that ne were never there. We have cities that people can see on the horizon, but aren't there as well. I mean, the, you can see stuff very clear. I mean, you know, people say, I know what I saw. Well, you really don't. Right. Uh, you know, vision is, is very fickle as it is, but there are also so many natural phenomena that we, we don't understand that do occur, like those mm -hmm. lights we were talking about in uh, Norway. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, I'm not sure that a lot of this stuff isn't just our planet we live on that, that's creating some of this stuff. But, I mean, we, we can go beyond that into other I also aspects. think Susan's emphasis is important because we don't spend a lot of time talking about the receptor and the filter of the receptor because you and I talk. Oh, we talk actually, you and I talk a lot yeah. about it. Yeah. On the show here, Susan, we made the example of up here in New Hampshire, there was a founding father called Franklin Pierce. And mm -hmm. um, whenever there's ghost stories about Franklin Pierce, he's always got this powdered wig on and he's in, he's in his middle age and that sort of thing. And Ron was wondering, why do they always see him that way? Why do they never see him as a 10 year old kid or, or something like that? And I think where condition society conditions us to take stimulus and convert it into something we're familiar with. Yeah. Per yeah. Pareidolia, basically. Yeah. yeah. Or a lot of times what are called near death experiences where someone's in the throes of death and the chemical reactions are starting to happen, their mind conjures up the tunnel and Christ at the end and, you know, your grandmother coming to greet you because societally that's what we've been taught, taught to expect. So we, the, mind just, the mind just puts it together that way, right? Well, sure. And in different cultures, these things have different interpretations. It's like getting back to the lights with the um, the Min Min lights in, in uh, Western Australia. The Aboriginal Indigenous people feel that that is the ancestors. So for them, this is the these are spirits of, of the people that came before them. Um, whereas someone maybe from Eastern Australia with more of a Western perspective would think, oh, well, these are, are alien lights or, you know, put that different uh, perspective on it. So, and then in, here in Italy, the, um, some of the lights we've investigated, there's a rich folklore of it being a witch or a, a strega who yeah. has a lantern and lights and she's luring people towards this lake, uh, this mountain lake. Uh, and this has uh, been a folklore for centuries, but these are the same similar type of light phenomena that, that um, are unusual. Uh, and it's just our own interpretation. Um, right. the, but that legend you talked about, it you can find that in so many different countries. Here in New England, we have the Pukwudgies, which lure their, their victims into the woods by lights. Uh, you know, they're... There's so many, and there are other cases too, uh, you know, uh, corpse lights in, in the UK. And, and uh, of course, you have several lights like in Texas and stuff that do the same thing. So the legends are around the world. Um, it's like to all the civilizations of that era, light would be very valuable. Light would be mystical in a lot of cases, you know. Not sure where it's coming from, things mm -hmm. like that. You know, we tr we see light differently now. We see neon light. We see night all night. We see street lights. We see everything. All the civilizations, a light in the woods would be pretty interesting to them. Right. So, how does your witchcraft, you know, fill in with this? I mean, how does it interact with it? How is it? Well, my witchcraft is definitely it's it's part of my spirituality, and how it interacts with it is, I feel that. Um, because I've had these experiences and at a very young age, I was seeing these little beings that at the time when I was a kid, I thought they were ghosts um, because that's, I guess, I had been watching Scooby-Doo or whatever. Well, and when you said mom, little beings, can you describe them for us? I mean, uh, they were little beings. Some of them were, were various. Um, one little of them, meaning two inches, willing meaning four feet, milling meaning what? Meaning, meaning little, like two, three feet, maybe up to four okay. feet at best. Right. Um, some looked uh, rather, you know, normal, like uh, you or I would look just in miniature. Um, others, there was a, a little boy that I would have telepathic type communication, or at least that's what I was perceiving as a child that was completely blue. Um, and then another one that was that was green, green appearance. 
Um, and I was scared of them. And uh, in the book, I talk about um, being afraid, thinking that they were ghosts at various points, um, you know, being in my bed at night and having all my stuffed animals guarding me as a kid. And then eventually I had uh, this large talking wolf appear that would frighten these beings away. And as an adult, I realized that I probably created this, this wolf as a protector and that it actually was some representation of myself. This is the psychology version of it. The rationalization of it. Yes, but as a, uh, you know, as an adult, as a young adult, when I had a UFO experience when I was 23, I had to reevaluate all my thinking um, and realize that no, there is something more than just the imagination at work. Uh, and that was an invitation into a way of magical thinking. And this is how I describe myself in the book Cosmic Witch, is that my witchcraft really was an evolution out of these experiences and being a magical thinker, which allowed my own spirituality to grow. So it's it's literally there's a lot of autobiography as well in the book as it being you know um a reference guide to to understanding modern witchcraft and, so, and what's the name of the book and where is it available uh cosmic witch you can order it through a you link. don't have one like right there you can show <laughs> us come on there you go that's what we want to see cosmic <laughs> witch. there you go <laughs> You can order it through your local bookstore. You know, I'm always pro, you know, supporting the locals, but I mean, it's also available on Amazon. Um, and it really does, it gets into my own experiences, historical witches, and uh, and sort of a way forward, so to speak. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more, but we have to take a break right now. Take a break. So, yeah. So you're listening to uh, Ghost Chronicles, what are we here? Oh, the morning, morning edition, edition right here on uh, New England Talk Radio, brought to you by Circles of Wisdom, 386 Merrimack Street in Methuen, Massachusetts, and the Gallant Messier Family Law Group, 15 High Street, North End over Massachusetts, and our very good friends on Patreon, uh, Ghost Chronicles Radio on Patreon, right? That's what it is. That's right. Okay, we'll be right back. Do you have a paranormal event, book, or something else you want people to know about? Then why not advertise it on Ghost Chronicles Radio? With over 150,000 downloads a month, get your message out to an audience that's interested in the subject. We have a plan at a cost that fits your needs. For more information, contact Ron Kolick at anyghostproject at comcast.net or call 978-455-6678. Are you seeing a ghostly apparition every time you look in the mirror? Are you terrified to realize that that pale, lifeless, lack of energy form hovering before you is in fact you? How would you like to be transformed? Healing begins from within, and it's never too late to start feeling good. Are you curious? Interested? Good. Don't wait another minute. Visit transformyourlifenow.org or contact Maureen. The email address is maureen at transformyourlife.org. Everyone is cashing in on social media, and all marketing roads lead through social media. If you want to make a splash here in the Merrimack Valley, you need to tap in. This is where the new CEM Podcast Studios come in. Of course, you can spend your time, energy, and money learning how to wrangle technology to make a podcast instead of running your business. Or you can invest in telling everyone in the Merrimack Valley, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, the Seacoast, or everywhere in the world about your great business, product, service, or yourself. The CEM Podcast Studio is a local audio and video studio dedicated to the craft of podcasts. Their studios feature state-of-the-art recording and mixing equipment designed specifically to produce the best audio and video podcast. Best of all, all you need to worry about is your show, your business, and your brand. We do the rest. Call 978-686-9966. That's 978-686-9966 to schedule a no-obligation tour of the CEM facilities and meet with a podcast specialist. Or go to CEMpodcast.com to find out more about podcasting services. CEMpodcast.com, your window to the world. Welcome back to Ghost Chronicles Morning Edition with your host, New England's own Van Helsing, Ron Kolick, his guest, Susan Demita, live from Italy. 
is, which is what six hours difference. Six hours difference. So yeah. it's what lunch time? No, seven there, right? Oh, oh. I'm sorry. I'm still gonna mute it. Sorry, Susan. All right, go ahead. She yeah. muted. He he doesn't like you. I knew it. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> yeah. So what's for supper tonight in Italy? Pizza. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> great in Italy, but um, no, probably something light. I don't know. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't thought that far ahead. No, your husband hasn't made it yet. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we, we're touching a lot of things. That it's kind of intriguing about your life in general because uh, you, you have a, a you, you call yourself a witch, means you believe in witchcraft and, and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, Susan and I are kind of aligned. I get the feeling we're, you're aligned. we're very aligned. Yeah. Yeah. Are you a witch too there, Lou? No, I'm not a witch too. I've got another name for you, but it's not a witch. <laughs> I can tell you that. But. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, are we, what are you aligned about? She um, uh, is open to a lot of the things we talk about, mm -hmm. but is also willing to look at it from a couple of different angles and try to That's triangulate it and figure things out. Yes. Well, you should. Yeah. So yeah. the, which, I mean, I want to touch a little bit about uh, being a witch. I mean, that's people, especially nowadays, it's really vogue to be a witch. Um, you know, everybody calls himself a witch. Um, so do you, do you practice? Pra I guess that's, the, I think I'm looking at, do you practice witchcraft? Yes, it's it's a daily part of my life. I have um, more an than I have an altar. I have more than actually one altar, but I have one daily altar. Mm -hmm. I I sing and I make offerings to the local spirits here for okay. allowing me to be in their space um, and keeping me safe in these strange times. Here, I'm um, cultivating a relationship with the local nature. Uh, like I said, I live in this wonderful area of wild forest, and uh, so we have a lot of, of, of wonderful nature here. It's beautiful. The skies at night, I can sometimes I can see the Milky Way. So it's, it's very conducive to um, bonding with nature, uh, which because as a witch, um, I am pagan as well. I view the world through an animistic lens. So that means I feel everything has life or sentience or life. Um, so it's, it's um, <clears throat> definitely, it's a daily part of my life and it informs my research uh, into these, uh, I call them exceptional human experience, but uh, paranormal experiences. Um, and not all of this is culminating from the, uh, having these early childhood experiences that, like I said, they allow me to um, be a magical thinker. I do accept magic as a reality. I view it as a form of psi or psychic, psychic ability, non-local information, um, psychokinesis, uh, and basic curses. Yeah, I do. I, I do believe in curses. So you I, do curses? Uh, no, it's not I something. I behave myself is what I'm asking, I guess. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not a curse. Doing a curse is something that um, I'm, I'm not opposed to it per se, ethically, but it's not something I would ever do lightly um, because I do believe that our intentions and our will uh, can shape reality. Um, I'm, I'm a big uh, believer in that, and I'm very interested in that from a parapsychological point of view, uh, as well as, as a quantum physics point of view. These are like quantum physics is not my, you know, uh, expertise, but I am interested in how these physicists are, are viewing different forms of reality, um, potentially in parallel worlds and things like that. Um, so yeah, when it, when it comes to the witchcraft stuff though, I do, um, you know, I, I take it very seriously and I believe in it. That's why I'm, I am threefold? this. So do you believe in the threefold or no, I don't consider myself a Wiccan. I, I do okay. in the book I talk about Wicca and I, I give much respect to Wicca because it is really the foundings of modern witchcraft as mm -hmm. we know it. Um, but I'm not a Wiccan per se. I'm, okay. I'm a soul independent witch. And 
a cosmic wedge. <laughs> so uh, no, I don't. I don't really necessarily believe in that. But I am guided by my own conscience and 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 you know how I treat people, how I would like to be treated. And I don't think you know cursing people is something to be taken lightly. You know. No, Lou and I both talk about power and tension. It's it's something that he and I. Uh, discussed many, many times. And, and you have, you know, uh, modalities like the cigarette, you know, the, that movie that came out. Oh, the, yeah. yeah. You don't like my accent? Is that what you're saying? No, I was just making cigarette. sure I understood which. How do you say it? Cigarette. The secret. Whatever. I, I do two syllables. <laughs> the secret. Fine. <laughs> Anyways, and, and there are other, I mean, there's like, for instance, uh, we're working, I'm working with uh, parapsychologist Cal Cooper in, in the UK on uh, be able to uh, create things with with your mind, basically. You the old like from the book in Mental State of Goats, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the secret says you manifest things. Sure. With thought. Yeah. So is isn't that kind of like all the same? I mean, so how do how do we distinguish is is it I guess it would be the same as, as religion, right? They all believe in God, depending how you view God, I guess, right? So is, is that my... Well, right? yes. Am I correct in that or not? I would say yes. It's it's about manifestation. It, it Like, I mean, this is the thing. When I talk about some of... And I'm, I'm writing a second book on conjuring UFOs. Ooh. Um, it's going to be a little bit more about opening a, a sort of grimoire. Yeah. Yeah book, a notebook on my, my experimentation. I can write these experiments up using scientific language and make it sound like very much a parapsychological experiment in, in creating or manifesting, say, a tulpa or a thought form or whatever, in this case, a UFO. Or I could write it up using occult terms and magical uh, speak and make it much sound much more like an occult ritual. Okay. So in essence, I think, again, the mechanisms are, are similar and it's what we create around it. You know, it's, it's how we word things, how we design these things is how we're going to label them or identify them, whether it's, it's an experiment in parapsychological, uh, you know, trying to create psi or whether, you know, I'm trying to conjure a spirit using witchcraft, probably the same thing. Right. So it's, it's, the, yeah, I mean, what's that other thing we have? The board. You, I forget the name of the board. Oh, me and my names. You, you have a board where you put things you want to Vision happen. board. Vision board. Thank yeah. you very much, Lou. And that's that's. I mean, I mean, you look at these. They're they're so similar in ways. You know, we basically you're you're visualizing. You're yeah. you're manifesting. You're you know creating. Mm -hmm. But it's it's how you do it, I guess. Right. But here's the difference. Here's the difference to me and Susan. I'm interested in your opinion on this because I've done. I've talked to a lot of witches on this show, and I do a couple other shows with other with witches yeah. as well. And I've been doing mindfulness for five, seven years now. Looked into that a little bit. And for me, the secret was, and I don't. I'm not putting forth the secret as the end all be all, but it's all the same principles. But the secret put it to me in a way I could handle it at the time, and it made sense to oh, me. A commercial way. That's why. Maybe, yeah, yeah, whatever. It's, but, it's, right. it, it's it's an occult truth. Like these things do work. Um, there's there's even more methods you can use that can that can jump that even more to make them work even even easier, in my opinion. But it's it is it's it's I agree but, with you. But the basics of this is that human beings tend to look at the external for their outcomes, and all the mindfulness. Uh, I'm doing a podcast on the Gita now and Hinduism and that whole everything having to do with that. And when I'm doing show with witches, what I'm hearing is um, learning how to take control of what's internal and the control that you have. Humans look external. Things happen to them. And that's not always the case. A lot of times what happens, that outcome is the result of your thinking, your thoughts and the way the way you deal with them. So that's the basic definition your of own destiny. Well, yeah, well, that's the de basic definition of spirituality to me is that you start to understand the power of internal and you start letting go of the, your victimhood of the external. This is the basics of it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah. yes. I mean, there all of this, and and this is why the the title of my website and my blog is "Out of My Mind's Eye." Ha ha! Out of my mind. <laughs> yeah, you almost had me there for a moment. <laughs> manifesting out of out of my mind. Um, what the desired outcome that I want. And of course, sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. They never work exactly the way right. you expect them to. As a witch, I also, I, I work with various uh, goddesses and the nature spirits, more the nature spirits. Um, and I feel that they help me in manifesting what I want. So that might also be a different way of doing things. When, I, when I'm doing experimentation, parapsychological stuff with a group of people, I don't usually use the witchcraft per se, but I will, like as in working with spirits, but I will do that when I'm doing things on my own. So there are some differences, but again, it's like, I think that the mechanism and the operational part of magic, which is synchronicity, creating synchronicity, manifestation in that it's it's pretty much the same thing it's just different labels but do yep. we really need all this modality i mean we lou knows because he's played hockey and i have too that you go out there and, and you you know you're good you you think you're good and you're gonna do it and it just happens and you're, why is one guy so much better it's not always talent yes but to beat the hockey analogy to death here which we will. <laughs> yeah. All of these coaches are telling you the same thing. The game is played basically the same way. The principles are the same. The systems are the same. But one coach reaches you. The way he presents it, the way he says I, it. I don't think so. I it think it's, all it's more internal than it is yeah. external. I, that's what I'm getting at. I don't, I think. I was, go ahead, Susan. I was really recently listening to Gretzky since we were going to go with hockey. There you go. And, and his, <laughs> his, you know, he, the great one. And honestly, he during his uh, father, Canada, you know, because his father recently <laughs> passed away, uh, and his dad was his first coach, and he said it was his dad's love of hockey that really pushed him. It was that desire to please his dad, and and he just he he inherited this love of of hockey so much, and and I think that that helped. Of course, you know. We all have our own talents. We're all different. You know, some people might have more psychic ability than others, but I think at the end, we're all psychic. We all we all can start out at some point. And you know what? Maybe we're not all going to be the great one, but if we're enjoying it and we're enjoying the method and it works for us, then I'm result oriented. I, I discuss this in my book as far as magic is concerned. What works for you? The most important thing is the witch. Everything else is all gravy. You know, if you like, if you work with crystals and that works with you, do it. If you work with tarot or different methods, or you're into uh, ceremonial magic or high magic or low magic, whatever you're into, if it's working for you, do that. Right. And if you're uncomfortable with something, you don't do it. It's right. as simple exactly. as that. I, I, gotta, I gotta add something before I forget. I already forgotten it, so I have to <laughs> do this now. I jumped in with regrets. No, 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 no. It's nothing to do with the show at all. Actually, uh, I, I do want to mention that uh, next on Wednesday we're doing a special show on people's experiences on Ouija boards. So you can be a part of that show by sending me your Ouija board experience, and yes. we don't care whether it's good, bad, or whatever. Uh, you can send it to me at in eghostproject.com to let it in to let an eghost project book at comcast.net so that's any ghost project at comcast.net you can message me on facebook or on this page or or uh, one of the other pages that, that i'm on so I, I apologize for that but uh, we really want to hear your stories and it is wednesday so get them to into me all right so um I wanted to go back that we, we are talking about manifestation and you talked about conjuring ufos now, I'm not quite sure what that is, but in my mind, I hear you say you're going to conjure UFOs. So are you attempting to make a, a uh, psychic connection? Uh, is, is that what it is? Or is it something beyond that? Well, I am. Are you familiar with the work of the Owens, ARG Owen and his wife, Iris Owen, from the Toronto Psychical Research Society? Uh, I'm not sure. 
I, I, names, I, I, I got to start right off because yeah, forget it with names. Forget you guys with remember names. My I can't names. remember so my name. name. They, did, they did an experiment in the 1970s. The Philip experiments? Yeah, called the Philip experiment. Yes, I am familiar with that. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll be quick. I'll try to like wrap it up quickly for your audience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> your audience that might not be familiar with the Philip experiment. This was something done in the 1970s. Uh, it was done by a parapsychologist and, and a group of people in Toronto where they literally created a fictional ghost story. And, uh, and from that, they decided to do a seance uh, to see if they could create or give life to, in other words, an apparition uh, of this fictional ghost. So what they did is they pulled from uh, a group of people that didn't know each other. They were all different backgrounds. Uh, the only thing they had in common is they were all very creative people. And they, uh, over a series of months, they created um, in a very Victorian type seance uh, environment, darkened lights, big round table, uh, this fictional ghost. Now they, wanted to, it was all written up in a book called Conjuring Philip, which I found at a used bookstore many, many years ago. And I thought, wow, this is, this is really cool. They, they did this experiment and they did have success with it. They never created an apparition, which was their goal was to create an apparition of this fictional man. They called Philip from the 17th century. He had a whole bogus history that couldn't have happened. And their intention was to create a tulpa. Okay, so a, a thought form ghost in the idea of trying to prove that um, ghosts were coming from our own mind or that, that there was no, this was not a dead person. That's why it had to be fictional. They did, they wanted to prove that they could do this and it wasn't a dead person's spirit. Now they didn't create an apparition, but what they did is they got a lot of poltergeist like activity. So knocking on tables and rattling and banging and this kind of stuff and levitation of the table. Uh, this was filmed by a film crew, a Toronto Breakfast Television show, filmed them doing the seance, showing the levitation of the table. The table and, and, and this group of people ended up going to the Ohio State University at the time. They were studied by physicists who were studying the strange knocks. Like they would get the, it's just like the Victorian old seances, you know, two, two knocks for yes, one knock for no kind of thing. So I read about this and they did other experiments after, but this was the most famous because they wrote this book about it. Um, I read about them and I thought, you know, why, why don't we try this and, and do an alien spin on it? And I thought, okay, maybe we could conjure up the spirit of an alien. And, and honestly, I, I wanted to duplicate the experiment, but I couldn't think of an ethical way to do it conjuring an alien because people have really horrible experiences <laughs> with aliens. And uh, I, I didn't want to, you know, maybe cause problems for somebody's psyche in the future. Um, so instead I started doing experiments like this with the idea of creating a, a spaceship in the sky or lights in the sky. And so I've done these experiments, um, similar to the Philip ones, only with a more modern twist because we were doing it online where we would meditate together and we would do these experiments with the idea of sending a UFO to a targeted area. Um, I've also done this using creating a fictional story with another group of people with some mixed and interesting results. So that'll be part of the focus of the, the second book that I'm writing, which will be Conjuring UFOs. And I'm also writing a book, um, a second book in tandem, which will be more ghost related and, and sort of my experiences in, in ghost hunting and, and what I did for years with that. And so, yeah, <laughs> so that, that's where the Conjuring UFO stuff is anyway. I love that book. I love the idea. I'm looking forward to reading it. Yeah. We just talked about the Philip experiment a few weeks ago, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's intriguing. It's all, fascinating it's, stuff. Yeah. But, you know, but this all goes back to the power of mind. That's, that's, mm -hmm what it is i mean there's 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 so many uh different thoughts on it but a lot of people believe that we create our own reality in other words our reality is really not our reality it's it's what we've created excuse me it's not everybody's reality it's what we've created yes um you know 
it, and we and we can be understand that because um, if you, for instance, if you you're in a bar and you're picking up a chick, right? Pardon the analogy. Uh, a couple of hockey players afterward, right? It's been what, a long time, but yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. But I mean, it, you you can see a woman that's absolutely gorgeous to you. Oh yeah. But somebody else can say, "Ooh, that's not my type." No offense, Susan. No, it's just I, some bad I'll get analogy. More, <laughs> I'll get more basic. You look. You're a chick. You're right. So you don't have to worry. <laughs> I'll get more basic than that. The color red doesn't exist. None of these colors right, exist. Exactly. It's and we a, talked about that. There, it's the a colors that don't exist. Yeah. That our mind interprets. Right. So, Susan, the debate. Uh, uh, what we talk about in this show a lot is how much the mind. How much the mind is the creator, and how much the mind is the receptor. In other words, yeah. the mind is always taking in stimulus and its job is to make something sensible out of that stimulus. So mm -hmm. if something paranormal were, tr were sending out stimulus in some form and we put it together as Franklin Pierce as a guy with a powdered wig in his mid 40s, uh, that doesn't discount either the source, the stimulus or the mind. It's just the mind is like a radio. It takes in a signal and presents you something to it. The mind also creates stuff like colors and, you know, the, the bear in the back of the cave and things like that. So that's always the debate, isn't it, with a lot of these paranormal experiences? How much is the mind creating and how much is the mind receiving and coloring and, you know, putting in a box for you to present to you? Well, that's the thing. It, it, I think that um, because I, I accept the reality of other intelligence, non-human intelligence, um, that we could be co-creating. So um, whatever it is that is, is co-creating with us is, you know, we're interpreting it through our own filters culturally and, and what epoch we're living in and this sort of thing. Um, I think that we, we do uh, co-create it and that in part um, there is a base reality, but our minds are interpreting it. So we're playing with that base reality and maybe even time like, time as we know it, we, we experience it in a linear fashion, right. We not be, right? So Psy, I think, which is the main operative um, of all these experiences, uh, can be happening in and out of time, sort of like a time loop. So <laughs> I agree with you. I mean, we, we do have paranormal experiences where you have, you know, time slips, for instance. Yeah. Time yeah. slips is, is a difficult to explain one way or another. I mean, other than, well, no, I mean, there are theories of it, but it, it's still difficult. You know, the Steve Parsons did a lot of work with uh, time slips and had experience of his own. And I think we've all had some type of a time slip or, or a lost time period in our lives, one, one way or the other. A lot of times we just don't look it, but, uh, you know, how many times have we said, oh, where has the time gone? And mm -hmm. it shows you that time is man-made, but we, we have these missing periods. And, and what, why, why do we have these missing periods or these things? Uh, is it something that we create or is something that we're not creating at the time? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and, and everybody does have those types of experiences. Everybody seems to have like deja vu. You have both thing, by the way, too, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With the missing time. Or, you know, um, like, I, like I said, deja vu, uh, meaningful coincidence or synchronicities. Um, people have these experiences and they seem to be universal. But how we interpret them and um, how we describe them, that, that changes with culture and time and, you know. <sighs> I was laughing at your experience about about the UFO and you talking about what you wanted to believe there because I remember having an experience recently with my girlfriend's 15 year old daughter and was sitting on the back hey. deck looking at the sky, and um, oh, I remember that one. Yeah, we're looking at the sky and all of a sudden this thing comes across the sky in a straight line and it's not as fast as a meteor and it's not as slow as a plane and it's exceptionally high and it catches our eye and we watch it and then there's one right behind it and then there's one right behind it and there's one right behind that. And she's running off going, you know, you know, space warp and aliens and things like that. <laughs> and I asked the second day and I didn't know about the whole SpaceX program with the Internet loop and the satellite strings they were putting out there. And that's what it was. But she immediately went to something a little bit more paranormal because that's what the, she wanted. That's what she wanted. She wanted the sensation yeah, yeah. of that having that experience. And, you know, I wasn't quite there. I'm going, OK, it, it may be aliens. It's kind of weird, but I'm guessing there's an explanation.
Yep. I know we're running out of time in the show, but yep. uh, before I forget, I want to get Susan. If people want to find out more about you, Susan, how can they do that? Um, the best way is through my website, which is susandemeter.com. So S-U-S-A-N d-e-m-e-t-r dot com and that will give you all my social media channels and um you know and information on on my projects and the books i'm writing and that can i hold up my book again absolutely i'm so proud of it Whoop, i'll try to she get it there. cool cover too by the way yep yeah very cool cover. yeah that was done by red pill junkie um so absurd by design miguel romero from the daily grail he designed this cover for me, so it was beautiful. So yeah, it's a lot of, there's a lot of paranormal in there. There's a lot of history of witchcraft as well, and some that maybe uh, North American audiences wouldn't be more familiar because I decided to concentrate more on Central Europe uh, and the the witch trials at that point and some of the more fascinating witches. A lot the, worse than ours, by the way. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so. But, yeah, we burn no witches. Yeah. I'm sorry. We Susan, didn't. this was fun. Thanks for the appearance. Yeah, thank today. you. And thank you for putting up with us. I mean, just a couple of guys that <laughs> don't know what they're doing, evidently. But I was always fun to talk hockey to. I don't really get a chance to talk hockey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Susan. And um, thank you. best of luck. And let us know about your new book, Conjure. I'm interested in that Conjure of UFOs. That would be intriguing just to find out more. Maybe when you get that one out, you can come back on. We can talk a little Absolutely. bit more about that. All right, so we got to wrap it up. We want to thank everybody for uh, listening today and thank Circles of Wisdom, 386 Merrimack Street in Methuen, Massachusetts, and, of course, the Gallant Messier Family Law Group. And remember, stay safe, God bless, and keep your stick on the ice. From ghoulies to ghosties, long leggedy beasties, and things that go bump in the night, deliver us, good Lord.